This is lecture 15 on the skeletal muscular system, muscle system 1. Now, there are three types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is going to be found in the internal organs or blood vessels, and it pushes fluids along the digestive tract or through the blood vessels themselves. It is involuntarily contracted, and it has no striations to it. Cardiac muscle is going to be found in the heart only, and it pushes blood through arteries and veins from the heart itself and functions in rhythmic contractions. Skeletal muscle is going to be found on the skeleton and pulls on skeletal bones. This is going to be under voluntary contraction. When looking at the actual shape and striations or lack of striations of each muscle, we notice some differences. First, spoon muscle has a spindle shape, non-striated, and a uninucleated fiber. So there's one nucleus for each muscle cell. These are going to be, again, found in the walls of the internal organs, and it's involuntary. Cardiac muscle is striated and is branched with uninucleated fibers. They are connected via a structure called an intercalated disc. These are going to be found in the wall of the heart. This is also involuntary. The final type of muscle is skeletal muscle. It's striated as well, tubular in its structure, but it is multinucleated. So there are multiple nuclei for every single cell. And it, these are all on the fibers. It is usually attached to the skeleton and is voluntary. Now, we'll be looking at skeletal muscle primarily for this lecture series and focusing on cardiac and smooth muscle when we get to their respective sections. But for skeletal muscle, it has a few major functions. The first function is going to be to produce movement. The next is going to be to maintain body posture and body position. Then it supports soft tissues, making uh, specifically with some of the visceral organs. This, it's going to, of course, regulate orifices and maintain body temperature as well. So the orifices would be the entrance to the mouth or the exit to the anus. And then, of course, the body temperature would be shivering. Here we can see the arrangement of skeletal muscle tissue with its striated appearance, which would be different sarcomeres placed together. We'll get to what a sarcomere is. And the different nuclei that are going to be found on each of the muscle fibers. Skeletal muscle is organized in many different layers. Starting from the top picture that we see on this PowerPoint, we notice that a skeletal muscle is going to be covered by the outer layer known as the epimesium. Now the epimesium will actually merge into and become the tendon that will attach it directly to bone. Inside the actual skeletal muscle covered by epimesium is going to be muscle fascicles. Each one of those individual clusters or bundles of cells is going to be called a muscle fascicle. If we pull out that muscle fascicle, we can see that it is surrounded and covered by the connective tissue called the paramecium in the next picture down where it says muscle fascicle bundle of cells. The paramecium will surround each fascicle and each fascicle is made up of bundles of muscle fibers, a, or a muscle fiber bundle. Now, if we pull out that muscle fiber bundle, we'll see that the muscle fiber is surrounded by an endomecium, the endomecium. Inside that muscle fiber is going to be many myofibrils. The myofibrils will make up the contractile units of the actual muscle cell. Surrounding the myofibrils and inside of the endomecium is a structure called the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is going to be the outer covering that surrounds all of the myofibrils. On top of that, remember that it has the endomecium. Now, where muscles connect to bone, the three connective tissues, epimecium, paramecium, and endomecium, merge together to form thick cord-like tendons. Tendons connect muscle to bone. So we shouldn't confuse them with ligaments, which connect bone to bone, although they are similar in structure. Where skeletal muscle connects to other muscles, they form thickened sheets called the aponeurosis. Some muscles attach to bones without forming a distinct tendon or aponeurosis, but simply interweave collagen fibers between the epimecium and the bone. This is called a fleshy muscle attachment. Now, when looking at attachments, we have origin and insertions. 
origin means the immovable portion of bone, whereas insertion is going to be the movable portion of bone. The insertion always moves closer to point of origin when a muscle is contracted. This is known as its action. In the case of the bicep, we notice that the origin is going to be up in the glenoid area on both the coracoid process and the glenoid cavity. And then its insertion is going to be on the radius. So the action would be elbow flexion, pulling the insertion at the radius closer to origin at the shoulder. Before we get into some of the microscopic structures at the cellular level, we'll talk first about the motor unit. The motor unit is comprised of a single motor neuron or alpha motor neuron that synapses onto few or many different individual fibers. This would be an example of a neuromuscular junction or neuromuscular synapse where the motor neuron is connecting to the actual muscle fiber. It's going to connect there at the motor end plate. Now it's not actually touching, but it's going to be on that area. And this is going to direct action potentials or nervous system transmissions from the nervous system to the muscle fiber to contract it. Here we can actually see where the synapse happens from the individual portions of the neuron onto the individual fibers. So again, a motor unit is going to be defined as a single motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it connects to. Now we'll begin to look at the cellular structure of the muscle fiber. A single muscle fiber is made up of many myofibrils. The myofibrils themselves are going to be composed of different filaments, a thin filament and a thick filament. The thin filament is known as actin, whereas the thick filament is known as myosin. Surrounding an entire myofibril is going to be the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to contain calcium. It is connected to the outside structure of the sarcolemma via the T tubules. The T tubules meet the sarcoplasmic reticulum at an area called the triad region. And these fuse all to the outside layer of the sarcolemma that has holes that lead those T tubules down into that lead different signals down the T tubules into the actual muscle cell. Here we can see the T tubules are extensions of the cell membrane or sarcolemma that associate with the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are called, called the terminal cisterna. The T tubule is functioned to bring action potentials into the muscle fiber and activate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. Here can be a close up view of some of the different muscle fiber cells and we can see how many of them there are. Now, looking at the actual myofibril itself, it's made up of the thin filament and the thick filament. The thin filament is actually going to be called actin. The thick filament is myosin. These make up the overall structure known as the sarcomere. A sarcomere is defined as the thin and thick filaments going from Z disc to Z disc. The Z disc is going to be an individual structure that when lined up with many sarcomeres becomes the Z line. <clears throat> and this is where the actin filaments will join together in a zigzag fashion and provide an anchoring junction for the sarcomere to be able to contract. In the center structure, binding all of the myosin together is the N line, the M line. When we look at the dark overall structure or dark area, we have the A band. The A band is the full length of the myosin fibers. This darkens during muscle contraction, but it does not shorten directly. And the easy way to remember the dark band is there's an A in dark. Conversely, we have I band or the light band. This is where actin is only, and this will actually shorten or shrink upon contraction and disappear. The final zone will be the H zone. The H zone or H band is going to be the space between where the actin are. It's the portion of the A band that the myosin is not overlapping. And when it contracts, this will get smaller upon contraction. Here we can see the organization of the sarcomere again with the H zone being the central portion where the actin do not overlap. The I band being the actin only, 
the A band being the myosin only, and the sarcomere going from Z disc to Z disc. We notice that we typically display it in a two dimensional fashion, but it's actually like the one that we see below, where it's a circular tubular structure where multiple fibers are going to be contracting and linking together. Now there are a few accessory proteins that are going to be involved in the actual sarcomere themselves. Talking first about the proteins that are making up the sarcomere, actin is the thin filament that's made up of lots of G-actin or globular actin molecules. Myosin is a thick filament made up of myosin units. Each has a double head, hinge, and tail, and they form what we call a cross bridge. This is where each G-actin binds with the myosin head directly. The myosin will then ratchet over and bring the actin closer together, and this would initiate muscle contraction. The green spring that we see in this picture is called titan. Titan acts as a spring and is the largest protein that we know of. It spans the Z-disc to the M-line and provides a recoil after contraction and also stabilizes the myosin in place. Finally, we have nebulin. Nebulin is going to be an anchor that is going to align the different actin molecules along the chain to make sure that they don't move. Now, looking at the actual molecules that will surround the actin, we have a few more. We have the tropomyosin that will coil around the actin and block it from binding to the myosin heads. And then we have troponin. Troponin will be dotting the tropomyosin and acts as a binding site for calcium to move the tropo tropomyosin once it's bound to calcium to allow for contraction to take place. But we'll get to that later. Here we can see another view of Titan and Nebulin. Titan itself will coil all the way through the myosin, anchoring it directly to the actin and makes up the largest amount of protein volume of a muscle. Nebulin is simply an anchor for all of the G-actin molecules and helps keep it aligned. Now, when we contract, a relaxed sarcomere first is shown with the different traditional locations we have of the A-band, Z-line, and I-bands. Upon contraction, the A-band stays the same, simply darkening in color, but the Z-lines will actually move closer together. The I-band gets smaller. When the ends of the myofibrils are free to move, the sarcomeres will shorten simultaneously and the ends of the myofibril are pulled towards its center. And this is muscular contraction. Now that we've gone through some of the events of the sarcomere, we're gonna be going through a summary map of muscular contraction, including the events at the neuromuscular junction, excitation contraction coupling, and then contraction relaxation cycling. This map is simply showing you the organization of the three main events that we will be going through in the yellow, red, and blue. We'll be starting with the events at the neuromuscular junction. And for this, we need to remember the motor unit. Remember that a motor unit is defined as a single alpha motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it connects to. Once that motor neuron synapses onto a muscle fiber, it can send an action potential or an electrical signal. This is going to be the neuromuscular junction where that axon terminal will meet directly with the muscle fiber at the motor end plate. Now there are a few events that occur. First, an electrical signal or action potential moves down the neuron to the synaptic terminal. Voltage-gated calcium channels will then be activated in the synaptic membrane opening. Calcium will then enter the cell from these voltage-gated calcium channels, and they act as a second messenger, signaling small vesicles containing the neurotransmitter known as acidiocholine to move to the cell via protein highways made of actin. The synaptic vesicles will fuse with the membranes and then release out into the actual extracellular fluid via excitosis. Acidiocholine then moves across the synaptic cleft via simple diffusion and then will bind on the target cell and create the action potential in that muscle cell. This will complete the events of the neuromuscular junction.